On the 1st of January 2023, Croatia adopted the Euro, and with it, it became the 20th member of the Euro area. The country has shown great commitment along its path towards the Euro, which hasn't always been easy. After joining the EU in 2013, Croatia made significant progress in getting its economy ready to adopt the Euro as its official currency. But how much do you know about Croatia's economy and about the steps it needed to join the Euro family? Well, that's what we'll be talking about today in what is the second episode in our mini-series on Croatia's adoption of the Euro. You're listening to the ECB podcast, bringing you insights into the world of economics and central banking. My name is Katie Ranger. I'm joined here in the studio by Martin Beisterbosch, who works in our economics department and was part of the team dealing with Croatia's adoption process. Martin, great to have you here on the podcast. Thank you for having me here. Now, can you kick things off a little bit by telling us something about Croatia's economy? I mean, most of us probably know the country as a tourist destination, but I've no doubt that there's much more to it than that, right? Absolutely. Um, I think what's interesting is that uh, Croatia is, uh, is a small and open economy, highly integrated with, uh, with the euro area. Around 4 million inhabitants, it's uh, around uh, half a percent of the euro area's GDP, so it's a small economy. Um, but its structure is kind of, say, broadly similar to uh, what we have in the euro area. So, um, um, but one thing that stands out, I think, was interesting to mention is the important role of tourism, as you already said. Mm. Um, it dominates the uh, the services sector. It's actually uh, Croatia is one of the countries that depends most on uh, on tourism as a source of revenue in the in the European Union, and and, and uh, it's around a fifth of the of its GDP uh, is accounted for by 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 tourism, and and that has of course also a sizable influence on other sectors of the economy. And maybe one more point that I think is relevant, uh, especially for euro adoption, is the uh, the fact that Croatia has a has a tradition of stable exchange rates. It created its national currency uh, in 1994. It was you know it pegged the kuna, the previous currency, to uh, the German mark back then, and after that in 1999 to the euro. So it, it has that tradition of stable exchange rates, which is important for the euro. Okay, so as you mentioned, they they tied or, or pegged their previous currency, the kuna, uh, to the euro, and they've been doing that since 1999. And that makes me wonder whether, in fact, they already had quite strong ties to other euro countries before they even adopted the currency themselves, particularly given the fact that they had already been in the EU for, for 10 years. Yes, absolutely. Um, Croatia has had... Uh very strong ties uh, with uh, with the European Union, with the Euro area, financial ties, for example, uh, the banking system, for example, a large part of the banking system, the vast majority of bank assets are, are owned by, um, by 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 foreign banks, banks from the Euro area, especially from Italy and Austria. So that is definitely one one factor. Another one is trade linkages. Um, the Euro area is Croatia's main trading partner. Mm. And in terms of debt, uh, that's that's definitely a factor that stands out. Where you see that, um, you know, we've seen a very high degree of what is called euroization, so de facto use of the euro in in daily life. Uh, for example, in the issuance of debt, um, for example, public debt uh, outstanding um, is around seventy percent of that is uh, is denominated in euro. That's very high for a country that, you know used to have a different currency. Mm -hmm. So lots of links there, trade, banks, also this debt in in euro that you just mentioned. So why didn't Croatia adopt the euro earlier? I mean, it's clear there were lots of links there. What was their path to joining like? Yeah, joining the euro is a long process, and, uh, and especially in terms of, say, convergence. Economic convergence takes time. Um, Croatia came from a, say, a different starting point after independence, had to go through an economic transition towards a fully functioning market economy. Um, and that takes time. Business cycles to converge, that also takes time. Set up the institutions for the euro, for the European Union, takes time. So when Croatia joined the EU back in uh, 2013, um, it automatically agreed to adopt the euro, like that is in principle the case for every country that, uh, that um, joins the European Union. Mm -hmm. Now, when a country says that it's ready to adopt the euro, then the next step is that the European Commission and the ECB uh, need to assess whether the country is ready for 
euro adoption. So and that is done based on a number of criteria, so-called convergence criteria. Okay, let's uh, just pause on those ones a minute, these convergence criteria, because uh, they're these kind of requirements, right, that the country has to fulfill in order to join the euro area. Can you just explain right. a bit what they are? Yeah, so uh, there are economic criteria and there are legal criteria. Now, let me here focus on the economic criteria. There's first of all um, the need to have stable prices. Um, that means that inflation in the country, the average inflation rate cannot be more than 1.5% uh, above the rate of the three best performing EU countries in terms of inflation. The logic of that is clear because you need to you need to have price stability to successfully say participate in the in the, in the euro area so that's basically the three with the lowest rate of inflation essentially correct correct mm -hmm. and uh, in the case of croatia that inflation rate was something like 4.9 percent so below that reference value mm -hmm. so that is one factor now the other factor um, the other criterion that's very important is the need to have sound public finances and in, in EU jargon, that means um, not having an excessive deficit. So mm -hmm. that essentially means that a country cannot have a deficit that is more than 3% of its GDP, and it needs to have a, a, a debt ratio, public debt ratio of less than 60% of GDP. It's a little bit more subtle than that, but essentially that's what a country needs to, need to have. And that is crucial, because once you're in the euro, you don't have your own monetary policy anymore. You don't have your own exchange rate policy anymore. So you need sound public finances, for example, with fiscal buffers to deal with economic downturns. So mm -hmm. that is uh, the logic of that is, is very clear. And it's also in the interest of the euro area as a whole to have sound public finances, right? Because if that's not the case, it can have spillovers to other euro area members. Yeah. Uh, we've seen that in the past, and that is definitely uh, so. Th that is the essence there of the uh, of the public finances criteria. Now, the other one is exchange rate stability. Uh, so, a country needs to have participated in the exchange rate mechanism, the ERM two, for at least two years without devaluing its currency. Um, and um, that is, in a way, an, uh, say an intermediate stage between, say, fully flexible exchange rates and uh, and, ha and and having the euro because it, it's a system of, in principle, fixed exchange rates, but they can be adjusted. And there's a, a fluctuation margin of up to 15% around that central rate. Uh, so um, it's, it's a good, say, preparatory phase for, for having the euro. So for at least two years, countries need to be in there. And then we have the long-term interest rate criterion. So there, countries need to have low long-term interest rates in a way as an additional test, an additional check to, 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 to see that the financial markets are convinced that the country has converged, that convergence is sustainable. And that sustainability is a key concept that we always uh, emphasize. Convergence needs to be sustainable, also in the medium term especially, given that euro adoption, of course, is a structural change, it's a permanent change. Mm. It's very important that a country can continue to converge also after it it has adopted the euro and then as I, I briefly mentioned there's also the the legal uh, the legal framework which is essentially about the independence of the central bank and a couple of other things but that is uh, that is uh, we look at that as well in our convergence reports that we do every two years or upon the request of a country when a country wants to adopt the euro those are the criteria okay and uh, Croatia officially fulfilled these criteria in in June 2022 right so that correct the stable prices, sound public finances, stable exchange rate, and low long-term interest rate, plus making sure that they can keep all that up after adoption. Yes. Now, let's turn to look at Croatia's economy today. How's it doing? Um, how has the country handled the shocks stemming from the pandemic and, and also from Russia's awful war in Ukraine? It's true that the uh, we've had a few major economic shocks in the past few years, like everywhere in Europe, of course, and Croatia has been, been hit particularly hard by those as well. Uh, being a country that's dependent on tourism, of course, it's no surprise that the corona uh, pandemic hit the, the country hard. Real GDP went down by something like 8 9% back in 2020 when the, when the pandemic came. Um, but it recovered um, quite quite quickly. Actually, it grew by around 13 uh, percent in, in, in 2021, thanks to tourism, but also due to strong consumption spending investment. Uh, it actually remained one of the fastest growing economies in the EU uh, in uh, in 22. Oh wow! So that was uh, that was that went quite well. Um, 
in terms of, say, the more recent shock, so the, 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 the Ukraine war, the country has relatively limited, say, direct links to, to Russia. Uh, so that is not the main, the main channel through which it is, it is exposed. Mm. Uh, but obviously it is affected uh, indirectly. So that is definitely something that is affecting uh, the higher energy prices triggered by the conflicts, for example, are mm. affecting Croatia as well. Inflation rose as a result of that. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's energy prices, food prices are up. And uh, even though fiscal measures have at least in the short term have been able to kind of dampen that impact, uh, but it's clear that uh, that is of course a challenge, and uh, like it is everywhere, it's it's broadly in line there with uh, with the rest of the euro area, the increase in inflationary pressures that we're that we're seeing. But what I think is interesting there is that uh, despite those shocks uh, that we've seen, that that didn't really impact Croatia's capacity to fulfil the criteria for euro adoption. Okay, so similar picture to what we're seeing in in other euro area countries, but indeed it hasn't had an impact on their ability to join the euro, which is obviously good news. Now, we've talked a lot about everything that Croatia has done to join the euro area. Let's turn to talk about the people who actually use the currency. What has it meant more concretely for Croatians in, in their everyday lives? I think the most concrete thing is the fact there's no risk of currency fluctu- fluctuations vis-a-vis the euro. So that means that people do not need to change their their currency anymore when they go abroad. It also means that tourists w- that come to Croatia don't need to exchange their money anymore. They can just uh, spend, spend euros. And that is good for trade, obviously. We know from the literature that uh, countries that share their currencies tend to trade more with each other. It's good for investment, for cross-border investment. Um, so that will, in the medium term, certainly have positive impacts and and uh, on on the Croatian economy. Uh, so that is that is important. That is a clear advantage. But I think that it's more than that. It's more than just say the absence of transaction costs, the absen- absence of exchange rate risks. Uh, as President Lagarde said in an interview recently, uh, the euro acts as a shield. Mm. It's a commitment, in a way, to stick together. So it's 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 more than just the currency. Um, and it, it also has implications, of course, in terms of, say, the responsibilities that countries have. Um, economic policies in countries that share the euro cannot diverge too much. So there is also a responsibility that national policymakers have um, to ensure the success of the euro and to ensure that, that the country can reap the benefits of the of the euro. Mm-hmm. So I think that the benefits, these benefits that I've mentioned are really, say, recurring benefits that keep on coming also in the longer term. Uh, and uh, and they, yeah, they are clearly there for Croatia as well. OK, that's that's a lot about benefits, of which there are many, as you've said. Let's talk a bit about the costs. Because we have heard, and and it has been reported in the media, also outside Croatia, that there have been some instances of prices being, shall we say, quietly increased during the conversion from kuna to euro. What exactly is happening there, Martin? That's definitely something we take very seriously. And uh, the Croatian authorities are monitoring that very closely. So there's been some discussion on that. And there have been... Uh, I think very strong measures uh, that the, the, the authorities have taken to prevent uh, that uh, that risk. So businesses have signed the code of uh, code of ethics for the introduction of the euro. Um, so they, in this way, were obliged to reflect, say, a fair pricing in, in both kuna and euro. So mm-hmm. since the uh, since early September, for example, last year, we uh, retailers have had to to display their prices in in both currencies, and they will have to you know continue to do that f- until the end of the year. Uh, and if a business does raise prices in an unjustified way, it can be reported by consumers, and the authorities can 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 impose fines. Um, so I think that there's a, a package of measures in place there to 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 address that. Now, when we look at what has happened so far, um, and uh, we we see that indeed there has been you know some prices have increased, especially mm. in the services sector, we see there uh, some signs of uh, of higher prices. When we look at, say, the broader picture and look at not just services prices, but, say, prices, consumer prices in general, and we have the uh, this so-called harmonized index for consumer prices for that. Uh, 
It's like the basket of goods, isn't it? The basket the of goods and services. Exactly, exactly. With so their prices. when we look at that and we look at the January data that we now have, we see that that effect seems to have been more or less in say in in the, in the same order of magnitude as that what what we've seen during earlier changeovers. So um, it there there is some effect, but I think it is it is not as alarming as as um, reported by some some media. And that's interesting because of course we are we have done this in a much more challenging environment in a higher inflation environment. Mm. So th- that also makes it more difficult to distinguish between say justified and unjustified price increases if prices go up in general. Uh, that's a more challenging thing uh, to do. So it's not straightforward to identify what is uh, an increase that is not explained by, for example, higher energy prices. Companies in general tend to adjust their prices often uh, at the beginning of the year. So yep. these are all challenges that uh, complicate say, the ident- identification of the of the problem. Um, but that's the, the picture we have so far. OK, so now that Croatia has joined the euro family, does that mean that its path has, has come to an end. So they can just sit back and in, enjoy being in the euro. In a way, <laughs> in a way, I would say it's the beginning of a new path, right? <laughs> it's certainly not the end of the uh, of the efforts because countries, uh, also once they're inside, they need to continue to work on on reforms, and uh, those reforms are crucial to boost uh, economic growth, to make the economy more resilient to shocks, to 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 downturns, to to st- economic setbacks. And I think when we look at Croatia, um, I think a key challenge that we see there is uh, is a challenge that stems from demographic developments. It's not unique to Croatia. Other mm. European countries are facing similar similar issues, but we do see, and there are available uh, reports that uh, that that show that uh, when you project the evolution of Croatia's population over the longer term, it's going to decline further, and that is a, that is a challenge. Um, will put pressure on pension systems, it will um, put pressure on public finances, and it will also reduce the availability of staff that you know could, could worsen shortages, uh, mm. labor of shortages of, of staff in, in, in the labor market. So that's a clear challenge. Um, I think another one is really, say, productivity growth uh, in, the, in, the, in the medium term. So it's important there to, you know, to focus on, say, innovation, fostering innovation, investment in new technologies, uh, the European debate often focuses on the green transition, mm. the digital transition. These things are obviously important also also for, for Croatia and, uh, and maybe also to broaden their, the sources of economic growth beyond tourism. Tourism is clearly it's nat- it's natural that, uh, that tourism is an important factor behind economic growth. Mm. Croatia simply has the natural endowments, has a comparative advantage in, in tourism. So it makes sense that that is an important uh, sector. But it is good to, you know, so to, to, to broaden those sources of growth uh, beyond beyond tourism uh, into, say, other sectors that can drive growth, that can drive productivity in the in the more medium term. And then we have public administration. The judicial system is always a very important one because whenever there is a, say, an economic setback and debts in private sector in the private sector increase. Um, it's important to have a, a well-functioning judicial system that can deal with the debt restructuring that is needed, and can, you know, so that that restructuring is implemented is done in a, in a swift way, mm-hmm. and uh, so that bank balance sheets are, are cleaned up quickly. Yep. Um, so these things are are important, I think, uh, to have to have in place. Well, Croatia has made a lot of progress on that front, and. Uh, so I think that uh, we can only be, we should be very positive on that front. But, you know, there's, there's, it's important to continue along those lines. Now, before we wrap up, Martin, we, we always have a question that we ask all our guests here on the podcast. And that's for a hot tip linked, broadly linked to the topic that we've been discussing today. Now, in our previous podcast uh, on Croatia, we talked about the animals that are on the the Croatian euro coins. Martin, have you thought of something for our listeners? Well, you know, w- when I think of this process, I've seen other um, countries adopting the euro in the past. And uh, of course, we have gone through some, say, more challenging times with the euro. But what one thing that strikes me and when I uh, see uh, the uh, Croatia adopting the euro is really that, you know, when you look at this in a more, say, longer term perspective, and we, when you compare that with how we started, we started back in 1999 mm. 
uh, with 11 countries. And now um, we've essentially, you know, the euro has doubled, almost doubled in size when you look at the number of countries that, uh, that use the euro. And I think that that's a really a strong sign of, of success. In only 20 years? In only 20 years. Um, it shows that the euro area is uh, an attractive place to be. And, uh, and I think that uh, that's something to be proud of. So I think that that is important to, to, to keep in mind and to, um, to celebrate. As uh, it's a good thing that you, that uh, Croatia is there, and it's a good thing in, not just in terms of say the number of countries uh, that we have, but we've also seen the euro area has strengthened over time in terms of its, its institutions that have been put into place. We have a uh, supervisory system, super banking supervisory system um, uh, that has been set up in uh, in something like a decade, and it's well functioning. We have the European stability mechanism, for example. You know, since the first wave of countries. We have added a number of changes, a number of institutional changes in the euro area that have really strengthened the basis of the, of the currency union. So I think that's, uh, that's something to be proud of. I think we often take for granted just how much has been achieved in such a short space of time. So I think that's a great, a great note to end on. Thank you so much for joining us today, Martin. Thank you very much. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode. I want to thank Martin Beisterbosch from our economics department for giving us what, what was essentially a crash course uh, in Croatia's economy and, and its journey towards the euro. Listeners, as usual, you can check out the show notes for additional material on this topic. You've been listening to the ECB podcast with Katie Ranger. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe and leave us a review. Until next time, thanks for listening.